Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sustainable Ag Conference. Thank you for joining us today. You have joined the session, Making Small Scale Hemp Profitable, Economics, Challenges and Opportunities for Carolina Growers, presented by Janine Davis, Andrew Wheeler, and Margaret Bloomquist. I'm Karen McSwain. I am CFSA's Associate Executive Director for Programs and will be the host of today's workshop. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the, in the chat section and ask any questions you have. I will tell you that we will probably hold most um, answers to those questions until after each presenter has given their presentation. Uh, please remember our conference community agreements and keep them in mind when you engage in chat or participate in group discussions. I uh, would like to thank our session, session sponsor today, which is CCOF. And if you have, an have not had the opportunity yet, please visit their sponsor page or visit them in the trade show. I am now going to hand the uh, workshop over to Janine. Thank you, Karen, and uh, welcome everyone. I want to say that this is an interesting platform we're using here. I can't see any of you. I can only see my own screen. So this is interesting. Anyway, today I would like to kick off our session of the hemp industry in North and South Carolina. And then Margaret is going to tell you about growing these crops, and then Andrew is going to give us his own personal story. So the big questions that's coming up for 2022 is what is happening with grower licensing? Any of you that are familiar with hemp know that in 2022, states had to decide whether to offer their, continue to offer their own programs or to turn their state grower their growers over to the USDA program. So North Carolina's pilot program made the decision that we in North Carolina are going to go with the USDA. So all of us who are currently licensed by the North Carolina Industrial Hemp Pilot Program, that is going to end on December 31st. So everyone that has been growing in the state licensed or wants to grow has to go ahead and apply for the USDA license. There's lots of great information about this on the USDA site and that's at the bottom of this screen to take you to that web page. There's also a webinar you can watch which basically just reads off everything that's on the, that page. Um, a good thing about this is there is no fee to be a licensed grower with the USDA. It does, however, require fingerprinting and an FBI background check. I thought this was going to be pretty complicated for those of us who are located outside of the, the big urban areas, but one of my graduate students and good friend just went through the whole process. He just got his license yesterday, and it turns out that there are local places around that you can get this taken care of. When it comes to your compliance testing, up until now, we went and went on the NCDA website. We said we were ready to have our testing done and it was arranged for someone to come out and pull those samples. For the USDA, we ourselves will have to select a sampling agent that is registered with the USDA. That information is included on the website. We're going to have to pay for that sampling agent and we're gonna to have to pay for the lab analysis. So it's gonna be like if you're certified organic, paying for your inspector to come out. We will every year have to report our acreage to the local FSA office, that is new. There will be a 30 day window from the time of that compliance sample collection until harvest, you know, have 30 days to do that. That's really great. The earlier thoughts were it was going to be 15 days. And there are various remediation steps for if your product tests hot, it just doesn't have to be 
destroyed. There are various things you could do. For example, you could grind up more of your stem material in with your your buds and your leaves to help get that diluted out. But all that information is included there. And just this morning, I had it confirmed that NCDA will maintain some kind of hemp processor registration. This is very important. Some people need this for their banks and such. They don't know which division of NCDA that will be in because the hemp program will be gone. Um, but they do want to maintain some kind of registration. So that'll take place. Now, if you're in South Carolina, South Carolina is going to continue to run its own hemp program. They uh, submitted a program to the USDA and it has now been approved. Now, South Carolina has always operated a little bit differently from North Carolina. In South Carolina, they have specific times months that they will accept applications that will start in January for 2022 and they've up till now had a limited number of permits um, it was up in like they had like 264 or something like that a year or so ago I don't know how many there will be that that information was not yet available but you will have specific times to apply there are fees in South Carolina so to be a grower, it's $1,000 a year. To be a processor, it's $3,000 a year. And if you're a handler, it's 1000 And if you are a grower who's also a processor and a handler, add those all up. That'd be $5,000 a year. There's also additional fees. If you make a modification in your site, where it's located, where you're going to grow, that'll be $150. So I think South Carolina is taking the same approach that North Carolina had taken. And that is that the program has to be self-sustaining. So it is the growers and the users of the program that, you know, pay to keep the staff employed. South Carolina also requires the fingerprints and the criminal background checks. I think that all goes with the USDA program being the lead now. The state registers sampling agents to collect the samples, but the grower pays for the sampling and the testing fees. And again, they have to report their acreage to the local FSA agent. And the information on the South Carolina program is on the link there at the bottom of the page. Now, North Carolina started hemp production uh, in 2017. That's when we had our pilot program. South Carolina started the year after that. And when we all got started, and this is true throughout the Southeast, it was assumed that our growers would want to produce fiber and grain because that's what they were doing in Kentucky and Tennessee. But from the very start, the growers in the Carolinas were much more interested in producing, well, at that time, we just called it CBD hemp. Now that we've got different cannabinoids that we're extracting for, in our program, we call it floral hemp. So we're producing it for those buds, for those colas. So from the start, they wanted to grow the floral hemp and they wanted to produce large acreages of this. And if you'll remember back around those years, there was all this hype about hemp. Growers were going to make so much money growing this. It was going to be so easy. Just produce CBD biomass and everyone's going to... Hemp was going to save agriculture. But very few farms had experience growing hemp. You know, we had a few people that had come from other states where it was legal. We had some that, you know had experience growing the illegal type. But we really didn't have farmers that were well experienced on how to grow this crop, how to harvest it, bucket, dry it, store it, or sell it. They didn't know how to determine the quality of the crop that they were producing because they had no experience with it. And those first few years, the genetics that were available to us were not well suited to our region. We had a lot of people driving to Colorado and Oregon to bring back clones to produce here. And for the most part, they didn't do all that well. 
our farmers didn't understand the market. Many of them didn't have contracts. And even those that had contracts, the companies were having trouble honoring those contracts because at that point in time, there was no money available for these companies to draw on from the banks to buy this because we had so many of these you know, legal gray areas pertaining to hemp. By 2019, this industry, the CBS, CBD biomass industry was just a bust. We still have barns in the Carolinas with super sacks full of biomass and growers are still holding barrels of crude oil from 2019. The prices dropped so low, our growers couldn't give this stuff away. So there was a lot of bad feelings about hemp and a lot of people did not want to grow it. So that calmed things down for a few years and I saw people making progress. Those that were sticking with it, learning to do it right, who developed their markets that were producing a quality crop was going great. It was a fraction of growers that we had in say 2018 and 19. But now where I see this same kind of excitement happening is all about fiber hemp. Everyone's talking fiber hemp. All of the, the press, all the, the hemp magazines are talking about all these opportunities with fiber. But again, many growers not have the equipment to harvest and bale fiber. They don't have ways to, to control the weeds. Our processing facilities are very scarce. Um, the supply chains for fiber hemp are not well developed. And it's just kind of assumed by some people that, oh, well, we'll just take hemp and we'll substitute it for wood pulp um, or to make paper, or we'll just substitute it for cotton to make fabric. And it's not that easy. You can't just move one in place of the other. It all takes special processes and certain kinds of equipment. So our end users might want to do this, but most of them are not prepared to do this on any kind of scale. And we must keep in mind that right now the hemp fiber industry is very well developed in other countries, particularly in China and Canada. So we've got that competition going on. And I want to remind people that even if the market is there, when you're growing fiber hemp, it's more like growing cotton or soybeans. We're talking returns in more like hundreds of dollars per acre, not thousands or tens of thousands of dollars per acre. So this isn't like growing steak, tomatoes, or strawberries. So keep that in mind. So is there a way to make money growing hemp? Yes, there is. And we do have growers doing it and doing it very well. We do have some people growing, you know, 10 to 20 acres. They've got a good relationship with a processor. They are doing the CBD biomass. They're not making near the money that they were led to believe they would back in say 2018, but they're doing okay. But most of the growers that I encounter that are making money growing hemp are sm very small scale producers. They're vertically integrated. They're doing the seed to shelf. And so they might be doing some in the field they're doing some in the greenhouse and some have very, very state of the art indoor grows going on. When I look at what they're doing and analyze it, I'm impressed with their branding, their customer service, their attention to high quality, um, how informed they keep their customers, the advice that they give them. It's all on this certain level. Most of them have no plans to get big, although we do have a s several now that have gone on to open franchises across multiple states. But most of them have found their niche and they stay on top of the trends. So, you know, they're working with CBG and CBN and Delta 8 and all kinds of new delivery systems. And our third speaker here today, Andrew Wheeler, is one of the people doing this up in the mountains, and he's going to tell us about his operation so we can get the details direct from the farmer. But then we have another hemp product, hemp grain. 
and we haven't heard much talk about it here yet, although there was quite a bit going on from 2014 to about 2018. I met with Victory Hemp several times, and Victory Hemp says right now that they will purchase 200,000 acres worth of hemp seed by 2030. They need this. I mean, we, we consume a lot of hemp grain already in many products that we eat. There's a lot of hemp oil used in salad dressing and such, but Canada is already doing this very well, so we've got that competition going on. When I talk to our agronomists, they say some of the biggest problems they see with this is that the seed shatters very easily. We have to identify the right varieties, just as we have with fiber and with floral hemp, but I think we're making progress there. Um, we have gotten very high yields of this, and Margaret will talk about this in her session. I do expect to see some serious production in North Carolina. And my crystal ball says, if you are doing certified organic local hemp grain, that you could have a nice little niche market there. So just some quick economics. And when you go and look for enterprise budgets on hemp, there's lots of them out there. Please don't look at anything that is older than 2020. Because if you look at a CBD enterprise budget from 2018 or 19, those figures could look really good. They might show you net returns for CBD hemp of $13,000 to $15,000 an acre. You need to look at stuff newer because that industry went through such a big adjustment. But the numbers are still all over the place. And these numbers I'm presenting here do not include those vertically integrated small diversified operations I just mentioned. These numbers here are for farmers that just want to grow hemp, so probably 10 acres or more. With floral hemp, I'm now seeing figures from across the country. These numbers are, are finally starting to come in some agreement. It's costing $5,000 to $15,000 an acre to grow it. There's all that variability because some people are using a bare ground tobacco system with no irrigation and others are using a raised bed plastic mulch drip irrigation system. So there can be a lot that goes into production. But the returns are ranging from minus 2000 to about $1,300 to $1,500 in net returns. So there is an opportunity to make some money there, but you know it's not the... $15,000 an acre we used to be looking for. Fiber hemp, it's a lot cheaper to produce. This is a row crop that you're growing. Production costs $700 to $900 per acre, but I couldn't find any budgets or any reports that showed anyone making money on fiber hemp from the farmer production line yet. The net returns are still in the negatives. Um, there are some growers, particularly in the Midwest, that are willing to still do this because it's not that much of a loss and they feel they're building their market. The grain hemp is ranging around $800 per acre in production costs, right now returning about $45 to the acre in net returns. But I'm told as demand increases, and particularly if you add value, value such as being certified organic, it's going to be higher. All of these have many factors that, that go into these numbers and I use kind of the mid-range prices and yields for determining these net returns. So I do think that hemp is here to stay. How big a crop it's going to be in the Carolinas we still don't know but I have optimism when I see people that are doing this very well. They have very committed consumers devoted to that crop. Um, we've got agritourism ventures coming in with this. We've got pick your own operations starting now. So I think you're going to still continue to see an evolution in hemp in this state. The grain and fiber crops, of course, are going to be best suited to large acreage farms, and they're going to have to have the right equipment, the right infrastructure, the processors, and that whole supply chain to make it work. Um, and I really think, and well, I don't think, I know, 
a lot of our small scale floral hemp growers are being staged to jump into recreational and or medical marijuana when it becomes legalized in our state. So as they design their operations, they're thinking, I can make this switch pretty quickly. We do have a website at NC State uh, that is an extension website that my colleagues and I maintain. And here is the URL for that. I welcome you to visit there. And next, I'd like to turn this over to, after we take a few questions, turn this over to Margaret Bloomquist, how to grow for small scale producers. And I want to say both of these shots are hemp that she grew just this year. Karen, I'm done with the slideshow. There we are. Yes, I can see you now. And frozen. Are we here, Ken? No, I was muted. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Janine. <laughs> Before I hand it over to Margaret, uh, do we have any questions from folks um, participating? And if you have a question, if you want to go ahead and put it in the chat box, we can let Janine answer those questions. And while people are typing, Janine, I actually have two questions. Um, one question is... There we go. One question. Um, I know that a lot was going on in the time frame that um, the uh, North Carolina Department of Ag was supposed to be putting together a proposal to the USDA if they wanted to continue to run a state hemp program. And so I'm curious to know, is the fact that um, the NCDA is deciding to go with the USDA's program and not have their own program, a product of not having the time to pull everything together that they needed? I think it was a 2019 deadline. Or do you think this is something permanent where the NCDA will permanently get out of kind of regulating the hemp industry and just let the USDA take it for the foreseeable future? Uh, Karen, it really was up to the General Assembly. The General Assembly is the one that never really addressed where we would go with hemp in the future. So because they never addressed it, NCDA's hands were hot tied to move forward with it. And if the General Assembly were to decide to address it in a year or two, do you think that the NCDA then would develop their own program or just at that point keep it with the USDA? I think they would want to see how it's working for the growers. Um, everyone that I have worked with with NCDA is really committed to making it work for the farmers. And they were very concerned with a lot that came up with the USDA program that it would make it very expensive. And you see the prices, the fees that are being charged in South Carolina. And I believe that that's what it's going to cost for them to do that. So if it is cheaper and if it is just more works better to run it through the USDA, I think that's what we'll do. But um, NCDA will continue to be there to support us, for example, working with us on, you know, keeping processors registered and, you know, whatever kind of support they need to supply. But there will not be a hemp program. We've got two questions in the chat box. One is, do you have thoughts on hemp turned into wood? Angie, I have seen some of the most incredible products made from hemp. I have visited various kinds of processors around the country, and there are some wonderful products out there. I think it's just a matter of getting the supplies at the prices that they need and getting the equipment going. And yeah, I think there's going to be some beautiful flooring. I've seen paneling. I have seen... Um, furniture made none that's real weight bearing but things like end tables and stuff like that so yes i think those products are all very much a possibility in the future we've just got to get these supply chains worked out and another question um are there seed selections happening for seed that shatters less or is it more a matter of better shipping techniques so Angie, the seed that's shattering is shattering, our grain is shattering while we're doing the harvesting. And so it's, you know, timing it just so, so that that seed is mature before it starts to shatter. But the advances, so we haven't done a whole lot with grain yet, 
but the advances I have seen with the varieties for fiber and our floral hemp have happened so quickly. Um, and now we have all these breeding programs going on. There's breeding programs here in North Carolina. Cornell is leading a big breeding program. I think you're going to see these changes happen very quickly. So, yeah, I don't think it's so much the shipping. Great. I'm not seeing any other questions. And so I'm going to shift um, the screen over to Margaret, but we will be bringing Janine back on at the end. So uh, bear with me as I switch people in and out. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Janine. Okay, Margaret, the mic is yours. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Karen? Yes. Okay, excellent. I can't see the rest of my screen, so I'm not sure if I'm muted or not. So hello, everybody. My name is Margaret Bloomquist, and I work with Janine. And we have been working with the hemp in the Carolinas since 2017, as she mentioned. I am going to jump right into things to focus on the production side of things. So we're going to kind of do a brief overview of um, all the kinds of different ways that we produce hemp for various products. Uh, so coming into NC State Hemp Research, again, since 2017, where we started with grain trials and some dual purpose grain and fiber, uh, working, of course, with our colleagues across the state to really look into that. As Janine mentioned, that quickly moved into growing uh, floral hemp, as we call it, for CBD and other cannabinoids. Um, not to mention that there is other hemp research going on at NC State that you can find out. For example, this picture is from one of uh, Brian Whipker's projects. Uh, so he's working on some things such as greenhouse production, substrate issues, et cetera. For today, we are focusing on the outdoor hemp growing. So this research has been statewide, both within the industrial hemp program with all of our growers and then with uh, the researchers through various uh, funded projects. Uh, when we do these trials and get information, it is across the state and across the departments. So from crop and soil science, formerly working with uh, Dr. Angela Post and now David Suchoff, uh, as well as Keith Edmiston and other characters. Uh, we also take in information through the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, as well as other institutions uh, such as Cornell um, and et cetera. So we're gonna start with the very, very basics here of cannabis sativa. So at the beginning of its modern production in the Carolinas, we were calling it industrial hemp. Um, and way to differentiate it from uh, the same plant, cannabis sativa um, and other species that are known as marijuana. Now we're just calling it hemp. So it is an annual crop. We're growing it in one season. So that means it's going through all of its um, life cycle, including reproduction in one season and is frost sensitive. Uh, cannabis sativa or hemp that we're referring to here is dioecious, which means you have female and male plants. We can also see hermaphrodites. Um, it is also photoperiod sensitive or day length sensitive, which means that it's going to change from its vegetative production into its reproductive stages as the days shorten. So that's something we can need to consider all these basics of the plant in our choices and how we produce it. So here um, on the slide you're seeing is some basic fertility information for growing hemp in all sorts of ways and how it's kind of distinguished. Here in uh, North Carolina anyway, and um, lots of South Carolina where we have predominantly mineral soils, we're going for a target pH of about 6.2. And just to let you know, all this data is from the plant um, handbook for cannabis as well as updated information from um, soil and tissue samples from North Carolina through NCDA. So this table is available um, on the NCDA website. Uh, it's called Managing Hemp Soil Fertility, which was updated last summer. Um, so for fertility, we're looking at mainly nitrogen inputs here, as well as various responses. So these kind of look like wide ranges for your other um, main nutrients. Um, however, when you have a soil sample, you can get information back. But just to inform that when you send in a tissue sample or other things, 
they are feeding these fertility recommendations. So here is a soil analysis, and um, I had a little another picture on there. I don't know why it's not coming up, but so soil um, testing when you collect soil samples from your field is done in North Carolina through the North Carolina Department of Ag and Consumer uh, Services. Uh, we now have a code for hemp, and that mainly refers to grain and fiber for reference. But now we are updating that as we have information. So a bit of a busy slide, but this just shows you kind of the different types of information you get when you send in a tissue sample. And we have updated uh, leaf nutrient survey ranges for uh, outdoor production in North Carolina. So you're gonna be looking at levels of nutrients within different stages of growth there. And again, this is all updated in the last year um, based off real life sampling and situations, different soils, different growing opportunities. Um, we have, we've been taught to believe or excited that hemp is a weed and it'll just grow anywhere. It doesn't need to be irrigated. It doesn't get pests. We know now that this is, uh, there are pests that do enjoy uh, cannabis and some more than others. And most of them that we have issues with come in right before harvest time. So that's something you really need to be mindful of, scout for and have plans for. Some of the most uh, pressing pests are mites, all types of worms, corn earworms, army worms, et cetera. Some damage from Japanese beetles, as well as some of the uh, pests that we don't usually see that might be in your rhizosphere, such as a nematode. Hemp uh, and all the types of production uh, we do here in the Carolinas also is subject to diseases. This is a long list and the ones with the asterisks, um, such as Fusarium, Pythium, um, <coughs> Vitrosophoria, all these things, uh, diseases, mostly fungal in this case, some bacterial, um, have been reported uh, many times. So these are from uh, disease samples and insect samples from the previous slide sent into our plant disease and insect clinic in Raleigh. It's also important to note uh, that for management for hemp as a new crop, there's very little pesticides that are labeled appropriately to use for hemp. Um, in end of 2019 season, so for the 2020 season, uh, the EPA did approve 10 additional ones and there are more in the works now. Um, uh, many of those were biopesticides, but be mindful that hemp does get diseases and insects, and there are limited chemical controls for them at this time. So how do we grow this stuff on a small scale? There are all types of hemp end products and kind of two primary ways of growing them. Um, I'm speaking from my experience as well as some other industry information, mostly uh, regarding small land holdings uh, here in the mountains of North Carolina where I'm based as well as across the state through our colleagues. And what is working for small scale hemp production, as Janine mentioned, is something that has a high quality product, not the large scale biomass per se, but maybe a smaller quantity of something that is high quality. And those that are being successful have novel creative markets as well as products. Um, and all these pictures are mostly from our research over the last few years. Um, in and around Western North Carolina and the Piedmont. Uh, so hemp grain we'll start with, similar to other grain crops, you are having high plant populations, um, anywhere from 30 to you know, 60 pounds per acre of seed. Uh, so the seed is drilled is uh, the best way we found to, to put that in the ground, shallow into a prepared field. So while it's drilled shallow, you wanna be mindful as folks know that grow other grains about your moisture regime, your timing, et cetera. Um, these seeds uh, at post harvest can be sensitive to shattering. Um, and I think their most sensitive time is just pre-emergence when you're drilling them like this. Uh, fertility can be referenced to the NCDA fertility tables that are in a previous slide, uh, but we're looking at around 50 to 150 pounds per acre nitrogen and depending on your phosphorus and potassium needs with your soil. Weed control from the get-go is something that needs to be managed. Um, once established, it tends to fill in well at high populations. 
Um, as a grain crop and row crop, um, certified seed um, is required. And oftentimes that's coming from other countries at this point and is imported. So you'll need to work in North Carolina with NCDA um, and your certified plant technicians. Uh, and I believe it's similar in South Carolina. So varieties that we've experienced with grain in North Carolina, um, primarily in 2017 and 18, and with Dr. Angela Post and one of her grad students who's pictured here, Zeke, uh, we're looking at uh, Canadian varieties, Italian varieties, other European varieties in the first few years. Um, some of them grow 10 feet tall, some of them grow a foot and a half tall, and as we understand, uh, hemp as a plant, as cannabis sativa, and with its photoperiod sensitivity and all of that, that's going to come into play with variety selection. Um, variety selection right now is also largely um, regulated by availability. So uh, there's that too. Uh, compliance testing, again, this is still a crop that has a low uh, regulated THC requirement. Um, when it comes to harvest for grain, we're harvesting with a uh, kind of standard combine and make sure you have that kind of equipment. If we're talking small scale, uh, you have to really think about how you are going to harvest, whether you're going to try to do that by hand or if you have access to a small combine. This is a table that shows the uh, weight in pounds per acre of a grain crop we grew for research in 2017. Um, the blue and the orange uh, distinguish different methods of planting, uh, drilling as our recommendation stands or broadcasting, whereas we didn't get as well of a stand. However, what this table does show is that we can produce high yields of hemp grain and that stands as over a thousand uh, pounds per acre, which is the line around here. And this is our first year, our first crop. And um, if you can't see these varieties down here on the bottom axes, these are the Italian and Canadian and some other strains. So again, the harvest, uh, that's a really cool combine, but most small scale producers are not going to be buying that. That was, um, it's a research combine and it's called green bean and it's really amazing. Um, so after harvest, you also have to be aware of what happens to your grain. So it's going to need often be dehulled, air dried and put into some sort of storage for transportation. But once it comes out of the combine, you're looking at a standard grain that can then go into other products. Some of the main challenges, of course, are seed sourcing, the shattering of seed, uh, processors, if you're taking it beyond this fresh grain, um, and then the equipment for all of the above. As Janine mentioned, an opportunity here may be for small scale novel products, um, a niche uh, relationship with a restaurant. Uh, we know someone in the area that has a small oil press that's been trying to do small high value oil out of it, um, et cetera. All right, so we are gonna dive into fiber production now. Um, and we had a lovely grow in the mountains this year, and there's also some awesome research coming out um, in the next few weeks from our colleague, Dr. Suchoff, on growing fiber in some replicated trials um, in the Piedmont and elsewhere. Uh, so he's looking at planting date, varieties, um, and more. So similar to grain, we are growing hemp fiber by drilling it into a prepared field. Uh, we're looking for um, high plant populations and very uniform. This is important for the fiber um, and the harvesting. Um, the soil type is somewhat flexible within the Carolinas, but it's important to be well drained and sometimes are very sticky soils um, if you don't have a good planting um, time regarding, you know, soil moisture can can get messy. That said, once they get established, they fill in really well and are relatively easy to grow. Um, fertility, you can reference the NCDA table as well. And this is one that definitely grows tall and you're looking for that length of fiber as well as a lot of other characteristics that are important to know as a producer. Hemp fiber production. So here the picture on the left is um, an 
we are harvesting with a BCS. So we're getting just kind of a few feet width um, swaths harvested on a small scale. Not sure if that would be economical at the prices listed today. Um, here on the right is our uh, 2021 harvest where we are comparing and taking data on length, width, and wanted to give everyone an idea of what the inside of this looks like because this is what we are harvesting um, fiber hemp for is this inner herd or the inner part and then the outer is what the more valuable part of the fiber is. Um, it can be difficult to harvest and modifications often need to be made for existing crops equipment um, across our state as it's a very strong uh, fiber which means it wraps around things and gets stuck really easily. So folks um, and farmers as creative as they are have come up with some things and there are um, hemp specific machinery out there, but when it comes to small scale, right, we've seen a lot of creativity. So this stuff gets big. Here is Katie, a research assistant and grad student in our program on the left. This is about mid season. We planted this in June of 2021. And on the right, that's myself and my family, three generations grow, harvesting some fiber hemp and it is up and over 17 feet. Um, so this is a little bit post harvest. You're starting to see a lot of the males flowering um, because with this fiber, as with the grain, you're growing the males and the females. So that's an important point to note as well. And once you hit um, flowering, that's seen as the time you want to harvest fiber before flowering or in early flower stages, uh, predominantly because of fiber quality at that stage. So we can grow amazing fiber as well. And I think uh, the data coming in from this year will show that. We grew a lot of um, actually Chinese varieties and one Australian, go figure, uh, fiber hemp varieties in the, the trials this year. So once you grow it and you um, cut it down, uh, there's other processes that have to happen. And maybe you're not doing these yourself, but this is kind of where the industry is. We're not sure who's doing these right now because the processors aren't lined up. So the redding. Redding is a biological process that separates the inner from the outer fiber, uh, the bast from the herd in the case of hemp. Um, there's a way to do it by piling it in a field as pictured. That might not be the, the best way, but uh, we are trying that out on our first harvest in 2017. Um, you can also do tank redding or water redding. Uh, there are also chemical redding procedures. So you harvest the fiber, it needs to be redded or separated and then decorticated. So decortication is where you separate the inner or the herd uh, from the bast fibers. And this outer fiber that's now squished by this ingenious little machine um, is the high quality fiber that, that would be saleable. Uh, this little machine, um, if you have a nice Department of Engineering students organization, uh, like Dr. Suchoff partnered with at NC State, maybe uh, you can rig one of these up, but it's pretty ingenious. Uh, the only other small scale decorticating I've participated in has been in kind of the wooden Amish way where you are physically pounding uh, these fiber stalks to separate the fibers. So again, uh, remaining challenges similar to grain are going to be sourcing the seed, um, adapting fiber to a small scale in terms of the equipment needed and the processing required, and or making a profit off a small scale fiber operation. Um, opportunities, the demand seems sky high right now from everything from the inside panels for BMW sports cars to animal bedding, you know, uh, all the cool things coming up in the chat box that Angie's brought as well. Flooring, hempcrete, um, all of it. Um, so there's opportunities there, but it is still a developing industry. Um, and as we have mentioned, this is a slide barred from Janine, but where are the processors? So we don't have grain processors that I know of uh, to store, pack, distribute the grain or to press it into value added products. Um, the fiber processors, this slide is about at least a year old. So I was trying to look up, you know, what hemp fills doing this season. Uh, I encourage you to do that. I know Renaissance Fiber um, 
remains uh, committed to being active. So keep up with these um, processors and, and small scale businesses as they develop, if that's something you're interested in. Now we are gonna cruise over to floral production. So this is a lovely picture of our end of season at in Mills River, where we had a location of the 2021 um, state variety trial. Uh, gorgeous site. So when we're talking about hemp floral production or CBD biomass or, or any of that, uh, we are talking very different production system than the grain and fiber. We're only using the female plants. In fact, if you have a male plant um, in your uh, floral field or even nearby that's flowering at a time that your floral plants are, uh, that can really screw things up. Um, you may have heard from other aspects of the cannabis industry issues with that. It can pollinate a crop um, and then your uh, pro product is either unsaleable or is less quality in terms of a lower CBD percentage or something else. So that, that's definitely an issue. Uh, you're having much lower plant populations. So we're coming down from um, tens of thousands of plants an acre or, you know, 40 pounds of seed an acre to more like a thousand plants an acre or, or maybe two. Uh, looking at different cannabinoids for the biomass industry, CBD, CBG, CBN, and more, um, and primarily focusing on biomass, there, there is not much of an outdoor smokable flower market. There's um, a lot of things to consider there, though we do have some small scale growers that will cut the, the, the prime buds uh, for that market. But we're gonna focus on biomass production for extraction. So variety selection, as has been mentioned, is of the utmost importance. Uh, we have a climate that is very different than where a lot of uh, cannabis has been developed, primarily specifically for hemp and low THC. So in the early years, we had uh, lots of Colorado, California, and indoor varieties um, brought outside into the Carolinas to see how they were performed. And some did a lot better than others. So we're looking at things like lower leaf to bud ratio for our humid selections, um, things that make harvesting easier. And of course, what we all kind of want when purchasing propagation material or seed is uh, uniformity. So something that's going to keep doing what we think it's going to do. Uh, you want to uh, really focus on high quality clones, uh, transplants, or feminized seeds. So feminized seeds, uh, and when grown out, you should have a high, high percentage of females and then actively cut out males. Uh, with clones or transplants, uh, you're hoping to only put females into your outdoor field. So uh, the recommendation stands to grow hemp in a production system that you are already familiar with and have equipment with. We have uh, studies from the past years with Dr. Post that show that uh, bare ground tobacco system plants uh, versus the same grown on raised bed plastic mulch um, systems, both on drip irrigation, um, are not showing many differences in yield. So if you have a system that works for you, um, it is definitely best to start a new crop and not a new crop and a new production system. Um, again, performing well on bare ground or plastic mulch beds, also really well in some of our small scale producers on no-till systems and with cover crops in between and more. And you'll hear from um, our grower, Andrew, who can bring some more to that following. Um, irrigation is pretty, pretty much a necessity with the floral. Uh, we did try some open beds uh, with Dr. Post trials without irrigation, and some did well and some didn't um, as it goes, but with the changing weather um, systems that we've experienced, um, I think it's best to have irrigation. Also, many growers are using supplemental uh, fertility uh, through fertigation through those drip systems. In regards to spacing and black versus white mulch, our studies in 2018 and 19 um, showed that between a four foot, five foot, and six foot in row spacing, so your plants are that far apart in row, uh, we often grow on kind of a five foot apart, so this is like a four by five, five by five foot. 
um, that there wasn't that much difference in biomass yield with the four to six foot. This was all done with kind of a standard size uh, variety, cherry wine. Uh, in 2019, we added the three foot and we saw that their, their yield was down as well as some other factors. The mulch color between black and white had no effect on yield, um, though in some very hot areas of our states, um, there's probably some reason that you might wanna use a white plastic. Um, and the three foot spacing was notable that it flowered a week earlier than the other spacings. We do have a PhD and uh, master's candidates that are finishing up their trials on colored mulching systems with floral hemp. So stay tuned for those results as well. So re relative to the other types of hemp production for grain or fiber, uh, floral production has a room for a lot of added labor from some people pruning their plants or um, working on them in the field to how you're going to harvest those plants. Are you stringing those plants like a tomato, et cetera? A lot of these plants, especially in the early years, get a lot, a lot of attention, which you really need to consider in your operation. And then of course, them being compliant. So now with the USDA's rules and North Carolina being under that and South Carolina having their um, spelled out rules for sampling, you wanna make sure that you are uh, compliant for regulatory THC. And the harvest is gonna look a lot different here. So in this case, we are hand cutting these plants. We're individually tagging them for research, uh, carting them to where they'll be dried and going from there. So again, we can grow really amazing floral hemp in the Carolinas, uh, but we want everyone to be aware of kind of what you're getting into. Okay, so you've had a whole season, you have amazing plants, you even managed to keep the worms off through your harvest and now you're going to dry them. You still have a lot to consider with post-harvest handling, including drying, destemming, or bucking as it's known and anything else to go towards your final end product. Drying in the Carolinas, especially in our more humid regions, it is necessary to have some type of climate control. It does not work consistently to dry in an open air tobacco barn, for example, or something else. Some level of light depriving and some level of dehumidification is necessary. Um, airflow is, of course, as well, and then we, you can lean into temperature. So we've seen uh, growers all try all sorts of different things. And we've tried many of our own. This is a modified chicken shed on the right. This is a modified hoop house with some white on black plastic and dehumidifiers. Just to share a little bit what we did this year with floral hemp, um, we finished a two year project on planting and harvest dates, uh, looking at May, June and July plantings with various dates of harvest. I uh, also like to include a row of another crop in there sometimes. That's a nice row of dill breaking up the field. And then our statewide variety trials. Um, so anywhere from 10 to 30 different varieties um, over the years from 2018 through the present um, have been replicated and tested across the state. You can go to our NC State ex Hemp Extension website to find those results. So to recap a little bit with floral hemp and uh, growing for CBD and others on a small scale, challenges can be increased labor and really keeping on what you're doing for those plants throughout the season and when it comes to harvest. The efficiency of that, of course, keeping up with regulations and remaining compliant with the program that your state is um, necessary for and keeping in mind the post-harvest handling considerations and how the choices you make as a grower do affect the post-harvest handling as well, from variety selection to your spacing um, to your equipment. You can find all this and more or links to it on uh, Janine and I's website, uh, ncherb.org. And I wanted to make a shout out. If you haven't been over to the photo contest yet, I submitted this photo this morning. So I'd love to get all those likes uh, towards my winning prize. So go on over there next if you haven't been and submit a photo of your own. Uh, we're going to 
let's take my screen down here. Think next. That's all I have for you today. And we will welcome Andrew into the presenter seat after a few questions. So we do have, thank you, Margaret. Um, and we do have one question in the chat box and I encourage other folks who have questions to put them up in the chat box. But um, Mike has asked, are there heirloom varieties of hemp that could be grown legally in North Carolina? Is it all the seed owned by seed companies? Thanks, that's a great question, Mike. Um, I don't know that I would call it heirloom, but there are a lot of hemp genetics out there all over the world, all over this country, and even within our state. Um, so if we're talking about floral hemp, um, there's kind of what, or any of them, we kind of call land races. So they're kind of closer to the wild hemps, even though there's some discussion, you can really get involved in the botany of this if, if they were just kind of thrown out of the window or whatever, and they became land races. So the shorter answer here is you can grow any strain of cannabis sativa that you can get a COA that shows that the THC is compliant. So not everything is owned by seed companies. And we're actually in a place in this growing industry where there is a lot of material out there, but a lot of it happened on the other side of the cannabinoid um, industry for marijuana, and those aren't um, available to grow here. So there's a lot going on right now in terms of who, what belongs to what and what genetics are where. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question completely. It's a bit of a, a large topic, um, but there are some that look closely, more closely to kind of open pollinated types and some of the wolf hemp um, coming out of Nebraska. And there's some folks in Carolinas that are working with that would be kind of the closest thing to that. Um, and I'd be happy to follow up with you, Mike, if you want to discuss that further by email or something. You have another question from Angie. Is variety selection something our extension agent can help advise us with? Great question, Angie. So the work that we've done with the variety trials across the state um, is so that we can um, help to feed this research information out to our growers. And one way we do that is through our extension services. So your extension agents have um, access to the, the results and the statewide tables so that would help with variety selection. And as goes, depending on your county and what agents are available, um, they may have more or less of an interest or experience with hemp. So definitely reach out to your extension agents about variety selection. And if, um, they can reach out to us or you can with further information after that. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, but you all will have an opportunity to continue to ask them at the end. So I think we're ready for Andrew to come on board. Um, all right, I'm going to share his screen and I'm going to unshare me. Hey guys, I'm excited to be here today. Um, can can everybody here confirm that I can be heard? Karen, can you hear us? Yes, sorry, I can hear you. Okay, okay. great. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so let me pull up my notes here. My name is Andrew Wheeler. And my wife and I own Arrowhead Hemp Farms here in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, it's we're a USDA certified organic floral hemp farm. Um, we got our start in 2018, helping a friend grow hemp down in Old Fort, North Carolina. And then in 2019, we got our license through the state pilot program. Um we will be moving forward with a federal USDA license for the 2022 growth season. And I really feel like sustainable agriculture's foundation when it comes to floral hemp farming is all going to start with a sustainable business plan. Um, this is a business plan that Oregon CBD published in 2018. And while some of the 
return numbers are higher then than they are now. A lot of the expenses and the practical thought that needs to be put into this crop is still accurate and applicable today. Um, you, for to grow this crop, really the, the best advice or suggestion I can give is start with a sustainable plan. Know what your expenses are and what you're willing to put into this crop and also work backwards. Um, if, if you if you can try to network who are you going to sell it to, what you're going to sell, whether that be smokable flour or processed oil or gummies or pet products, and also developing your relationship with who's going to process your crop um, because you can grow a beautiful hemp crop. And if you don't know the end game on it, it can be extremely tough to sell and the market is ever changing and you have to be creative, but working backwards is the best way that I know to give you a good shot at having a sustainable approach to growing this crop. Um, every crop starts with good genetics and you need a, a good relationship with the genetics company that you choose to use. Uh, we pretty much exclusively use Oregon CBD's genetics. They're a company out of Oregon and they've been in the game since the beginning. I consider them an uh, industry leader at this point. Um, every now and again, we will try side projects with other companies in small test amounts, but Oregon's stuff is, fem they're known for their feminization process. It's consistent. The cannabinoid profiles are consistent. The plant structure structures are consistent and their flowering times are great. So you really need to think about your region and your weather when you're making your genetic selections. You have hemp plants that can finish flowering in mid-August and you have some that can go all the way past Halloween. Up here in the mountains, we have a rule of thumb. If you're not out of the field by September 15th, then you're about to get into the trouble zone with rain, humidity, cold nights, fall weather. It just starts to kind of deteriorate. So I love their early flowering genetics. Um, this is a picture of one of their lead botanists and myself out in my family's field this past season, growing their new triploid genetics. Uh, they performed great. They're huge plants. They were resistant to most of the problems that we see here in the mountains. Um, good genetics get you off to the start that you need. You want stable, consistent seed starts to go into your field. If you're not growing from clone, then you're going to want I highly suggest a feminized seed start um, just to get you a, sem a feminized seed start from a reputable company just to get you that start. So you're not right from the beginning behind um, Oregon CBD stuff. As you can see here, this is in late July this last year. They have what's called an early series for their CBD lineup. It's half auto genetic cross to a half photo sensitive genetic meaning that it's going to be early flowering. You're going to get out of the fields before most of the problems hit. Um, this is one of their genetics that we grew last year called Lifter. And I can't speak highly enough about their approach. Um, Andrew, I'm going to just jump in for a second. I don't think your slides are advancing. Okay. We're going to take a look at it. Which slide do you currently see? This one. Um, let's see. We don't see any at the moment. Did you unshare your screen? I did. I'm going to try again. Okay. Can you see our screen now? No, just a second. That's a second. Okay, we're back at the arrow, arrow, um, arrowhead farm slide. Are you seeing me change slides? No. Okay, because I'm changing slides. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just go into PowerPoint really quick. Bear with me. Sorry, folks. We will have this figured out in a moment.
How about now? Okay, do you want to age? I'm advancing. We are not seeing that. Hmm. All right. Sorry, folks. Let me see. Oh. Okay, we see a slide. I can leave it in that. Well, I can do it too. Are you are you advancing? I am. We have a uh, tray of of hemp seedlings on the screen. We have two great looking people standing next to some fabulous looking hemp plants. Oh, cool! That was our last slide. <laughs> Cool. Well, we'll just, uh, are you seeing advancement now? No. Okay. Well, we'll just keep going through well, can this. We advance from there? Oh, I see. The, I, oh, we were, we have now. We are right. now on the tray. All right. Let's, let's try this. Um, let me know if you guys lose it again. Um, the, you can work backwards from, for the whole process basically. And that's not only knowing your end buyer before you even plant this crop, but knowing how much space do I want to use? How much labor do we have? Um, how, what style do I want to use? This is a picture we did at a partner farm where we grew a little less than an acre. And we did two years in a row where we did plastic fabric. And we said, we're tired of all the plastic waste. And we're tired of the rains not being able to penetrate the plastic. So this year we tried a landscape fabric and it performed well. Um, the plants are able <coughs> to to get natural rainwater, we ran drip tape under this uh, fabric, but in fact did not turn the drip tape or any irrigation on at any of our farm locations for the past three years. Um, in Appalachia, we get a lot of rain and hemp is not a huge fan of wet feet. And so we try to let it dry out as much as we can. Um, you could do a style like this, which is raised beds. Uh, this is at my own personal farm. We grow... It, my entire footprint on our farm is less than half an acre and we produce 20 to 25 kilos of full spectrum CBD every season, pretty much, um, which equates to over 15,000 tinctures and it keeps our overhead low. We don't rent land. We don't run irrigation. We don't hardly fertilize at all. Since we're USDA organic, anything that we do fertilize is OMRI certified. Um, and you can see this is a picture of my son and I. The plants get big and they can get big quick. Um, this is sometime probably late, mid to late August. One of the biggest mistakes we see is we see hemp farmers grow beautiful crops like this and they just it all falls apart at harvest. It's extremely labor intensive and really you need to know. Are you shooting for a floral smokable flower crop or are you shooting for an oil? Because it's going to dictate how you handle this crop and it's going to dictate your expenses and how you handle harvest um, to the point where it, it, if you don't know, you could be dumping extra amounts of unnecessary money into something and taking steps that are unnecessary to reach the end goal that you're actually going to wind up selling it as. Um, this Oh, one too many. There's another picture of River and I in the greenhouse. So at our farm, we do greenhouse, we do raised beds, we do uh, row crops, and we also grow indoor. We found that the more diversified we could be, the more approachable we were and for the market and the more companies we were able to reach that wanted a variety of different products and quality. Um, with hemp, it's a fast growing plant though. So you're, you really, if, if you're not used to growing cannabis, I would advise talking to someone or speaking to someone who has years under their belt of doing it. It grows quickly. The crop can be planted in the mountains in June. And like I said, by August and September, it's coming down. And if you're not ready for it to come down, it piles up everywhere. Um, we can pull, like I was saying, two or 300 pounds out of less less than a half an acre probably a quarter acre worth of space um it keeps our overhead low it keeps us sustainable and we don't have any investors and it enables us um to take this crop and take our product line in the directions that we see 
that fit with our ethos as a family on a farm. Uh, growing in Appalachia has a huge set of problems. Growing cannabis across the country in general, you're going to be dealing with fungal issues like this. This is what's called septoria. August comes and the humidity hits and the plants that do not have the air and the space and the appropriate spacing in the rows, they're susceptible to all sorts of fungal issues, mold issues. Um, sometimes it doesn't affect the in crop, but you need to know if there are appropriate sprays that are allowable, what they are and how to apply them. Um, I'm happy anytime a farmer wants to talk. I love talking to him and I'm happy to talk about it. And I'm happy to look at crops and try to help people through things, but you got to be on your toes. Um, if you're not, you wind up with plants that look like this one here. Um, this is what we call botrytis, bud rot, mold in general. And it can hit a healthy crop just based on the fact that your crop is so healthy and the flower is sets are so dense that it, it, you can actually hurt yourself by growing such a great and dense canopy that it enables molds and mildews and fungal diseases to set in. And when you get a crop like what you see in this picture, there's not much, there's not much you can do. Um, you're looking at tilling it in or burning it in a compost pile. Um, we take, we use what's called ethanol extraction and that's where we take our crop, we harvest it and everything that we're going to make into a product is run through a processing lab through an ethanol extraction process and anything that doesn't go that direction, we hand trim and it goes to the smokable market. Um, that being said, there's a lot of shadiness in the industry and developing a relationship with your processor is the same kind of step as I mentioned before, working backwards first because you need that relationship with them, especially if you plan on becoming vertically integrated creating product lines. You want the product lines to be safe. You want to know that the labs are CMGC, CGMP certified. You want to know whether or not they're certified organic. You want to know what their protocols are, what their SOPs are, because they're taking your crop, which is we see as our baby, and it's leaving your hands and it's now in theirs. So you need a good processor. Um, growing a good crop without a good business plan on the back end will resort, result in a crop like you see here. You look at this picture and you think, man, this guy's got a beautiful crop on his hands. He's that who knows how much money that's worth. This entire crop was grown in Tennessee last year. And the entire thing, every single flower, every single gram you see is still sitting in trash bags in a barn in middle Tennessee. And last I heard, because he did not have a vertical integrated plan and he wanted to just sell this on the bulk wholesale market, there were, he had no offers. There was no one that wanted it. It wasn't certified. It wasn't organic. It's a beautiful looking crop. He worked all year on it. It's good genetics. Um, but he just, he didn't have a plan he didn't have anyone to contact. They reached out to us. We didn't have any interest in it, um, because it wasn't certified. I wanted to try to help him, but we just, we couldn't find any, any outcome or resources to really be able to do anything with it. So it all is just sitting there. So his entire investment and all of his expenses, he hasn't begun to recoup any of it yet. Um, and we're coming in on the next season. So the big question becomes, do you go again or do you try to sit back and really reassess the market, reassess your approach? Um, I feel like that's been our strong point at Arrowhead. We saw very early on that vertical integration was going to be key. We work with certified labs that we are partners with. I talk to them on a daily basis, weekly basis. We're constantly in communication. We have a large product lineup and we take that product on a three prong approach. So we make many products like the salves you see here or full spectrum tinctures. And the three prong approach is wholesale, white label and retail. Um, you can wholesale your, your branded products out to stores if you have something that people are desiring. You can try to retail it on your web page or if you have a brick and mortar, um, but you can also white label and people just really seem to overlook that category. Um, white labeling is basically a process that's a partnership between the farm and your processing labs and extract labs where they take your crop, make it into 
an extract, make it into products, but then they leave the labels off. And we approach companies, retail stores, distributors, chains, franchises, anyone that's looking for a small craft made, high quality boutique crop. And we will formulate any products they want, basically, um, whether that's salves, tinctures, gummies, uh, pre-rolls, jarred up packaged flour, um, pretty much the, the, the sky is the limit with what you can put CBD in, soaps, lotions, topicals. It's just, it's kind of endless, but it allows you to grow your brand with a parallel path with your wholesale and your white label because starting off a brand and expecting every store in the country to carry your brand when they already have 20 other CBD brands already on the shelves, it's, it's a slow battle on a slow roll. But if you have other sources of income coming in from your crop on the side through white label or through wholesale, um, it enables you to slowly develop your brand because really the, the retail price has held the same the, from 2017 to 2022 people are selling a thousand milligram natural full spectrum tincture for the exact same price. Basically it's the wholesale market and the bulk market that fluctuates and that's fluctuating based on the fact that so many farms grew that didn't have a brand, didn't have vertical, their only option was wholesale. So there's just a ton of bulk material on the market and it has taken the price and driven it kind of through the floor. Um, right now, gummies are hugely popular. Uh, we do six or seven different gummy lines, full spectrum CBD, full spectrum CBG. We have a sister company, Small Axe, that does we call it the cannabis candy company. We do D8, Delta 8, Delta 10, any sort of minor cannabinoids. Um, the sky is the limit with this crop, but this is a niche crop. There is no, it's not like tomatoes. There's no set price point on the market each season. There's no, it's not a commodity. You can't think of it like a commodity. You have to really think of it outside the box. Um, Right now, gummies are hugely popular, so we're just we're ever expanding our gummy lineups. Um, the industry itself is based around the full spectrum tinctures, I would say. Um, but the excitement is right now is with gummies and smokable flour and Delta Eight and anything that's on the periphery. It helps give you that that niche advantage you're going to need to differentiate yourself. Um, we have our web page that people can contact us not only for products, but just to talk. We have people that call all the time that want to talk about hemp, want to talk about how it helped them, want to get our opinion on what they think, um, which product line would work best for them, whether it's for sleep or anxiety disorder, or it has huge benefits um, in the recovery for PTSD, for veterans. We have a large group of firemen that really enjoy our products and tell us that the relief they get has been something they've been seeking in the pharmaceutical world and they just can't find. Um, another way to differentiate yourself you're in a sea of just people that are trying to sell hemp is shoot for high certifications. We're USDA certified. Everything's full panel lab tested. This is a picture of um, some greenhouse flower that we grew, but we also grow indoor flower. We can grow an extremely high quality flower. Uh, it, it, the pictures itself will sell the product a lot of times. Um, when this industry started in 2017 in North Carolina, like Margaret and everyone was saying, the, the primary focus was fiber. And we thought that we didn't really realize that the smokable market was going to be what it is. Um, but just, just know all the different outlets for your crop and know in the beginning before you grow it so you can appropriately plan on how to grow it everything is different. Smokable flower crop is you need someone tending those plants almost on a daily basis. Um, our field crops, depending upon the genetics and the weather for the year, other than weed eating, I mean, a lot of that stuff's planted and will, it's pretty low maintenance. Um, but that's because all of our field crop is getting extracted to oil. So we're not hand trimming it at the end. Um, considering your drying space and how you're going to dry, it's hugely important. Um, an acre worth of hemp 
takes a very large building or a vertical setup where you're stacking rows using all of your vertical available space in order to dry it. So if anyone is thinking about doing anything more than an acre, please feel free to reach out, talk to Margaret, talk to I. Let, let us kind of give you a perspective on what you're getting into um, before you get upside down on, on the investment side of it. And then once you get your product line up and you you ready to launch your label and launch your web page and launch your brand, make sure you know what you're talking about. Make sure you understand your products in and inside and out. This is an example of a COA. Um, another thing that kind of helps us stand out is we do small batch products. So we'll only make 50 to 100 bottles at a time, whereas a company like Lazarus or a commercial CBD company, I mean, they're, they're pumping out 10 or 20,000 bottle batches weekly. It's harder to keep quality control when you do these large batches. So we keep it small and start to understand your cannabinoid profile. These plants are loaded. And every season you've got CBD, CBG, CBC, CBDA, CBDV. These are all cannabinoids found in the plant. Um, they all have medicinal values. They all have a place in the Canacopia library. Um, but you can't really truly stand behind a product and sell a product if you don't understand it. And we have people that call us all the time and they say, we've grown the crop. We've got the COA. Here it is. Will you explain it to me? I'm happy to explain it to people, but you really owe it to yourself to try to figure the ins and outs of this product out from A to Z all the way through before you get into it, because it's a labor intensive, money intensive, passion intensive crop. Um, and the more you can know about it, the better off you're going to be. Um, once again, the COAs are not only for compliance purposes, but it lets the client and the customer know what it is they're buying. Um, otherwise, this is the, the old term like snake oil. There's plenty of products on the market that they don't want to show you the COAs. They don't have a COA or they have su su suspect things are found in the COA. Get full panel testing on your crop. Tech, chest, excuse me, test for heavy metals. Test for pesticides. Even if you didn't spray, there's what's called drift that can come from other farms. You might have had pesticide residue left over on your land from the previous owner. Um, do your homework up front, and it's a really fun crop to grow. It's easy to get super involved and into it. Um, it's a very nuanced industry. It's forever changing. Um, sorry. Uh, this is a picture of our field last fall. Uh, just to talk a little bit on the sustainable aspect of this crop. Uh, cannabis in general is a very tough plant. It's very hardy. It is considered traditionally a weed per se, and it does well in a lot of different regions. Um, our approach on our half acre homestead is keep it as simple as possible. Minimal inputs, um, and we just see the land getting better and better. We use cover crops in the fall. This is a picture of our certified organic daikon. And there's a clover under it that we run. Um, we do till because we're in a heavy clay. But no till does work with this crop. And if you're in a sandy loam or something a, a looser ground than clay, um, no till approach is fine. There's no reason to think that you have to run this crop like big hydroponics wants to advertise it or like big cannabis wants to advertise it. You don't have to have bottle nutrients. We feed a simple OMRI listed uh, pelletized chicken uh, manure at the beginning of the season. And if we need it after a soil test in the fall, we'll make adjustments, but very rarely do we need to add anything. Um, we haven't added lime to this property in over six years. But we get a soil test every spring and every fall. And we also follow up during the season. We'll run what Margaret had mentioned, uh, tissue samples. And it just gives you a great readout and a great option for baseline. Even if your crop's healthy, get one done. And that way, you know, all right, this is what the numbers for nutrients look like when the crop's healthy. That way you have a baseline to go off of when the crop goes south. You can say, well, OK, we're looking at the different results. Calcium seems like it's off once the crop had gone downhill. And you have a base point for comparison. Um, but cover crops work great and 
just know your land. I mean, if you've farmed it before, irrigation may or may not be necessary. Fertilization may or may not be necessary. Companion planting is always a good idea. And just kind of keeping things as simple as possible um, and let Mother Nature grow the plant as it sees as it sees fit. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. And you can also reach us at the webpage. It's arrowheadhemp.com. Or you can email us at info at arrowheadhemp.com. And we are happy always to talk about hemp. Um, I hope this kind of has helped people understand the vertical integration side of the industry. And growing the crop is one of very many steps with this particular crop in order to get a payout at the end of the day. There's quite a few steps growing it, harvesting it, processing it, testing it, marketing it, and selling it. Um, and we're, we're always open to help any other farmers. So if you guys have any questions, just let me know. But I appreciate you all having me here today. I'm going to turn it back over to Margaret now. I'm not sure if the participants are seeing this, but um, Margaret, your screen has frozen for me. Okay, can you still hear us? We can hear you. And again, I'm not sure. Yeah, no worries. Me. I'm going to go ahead and bring Janine back on. Um, it's not frozen for her. Great. So it's just me. <laughs> I'm going to bring Janine back on um, and we, we've got just a few more minutes here until the webinar is over. So I want to, you know, let folks um, type in any questions that they might have. And I believe there was one question earlier from Lawrence. Um, you have caught, do you have costs other than land seed and drip line? Yes. Um, it depends on how you're approaching your labor and it depends on your scale. Um, your, your seed cost, don't, don't skirt around it. If, if you know a company is going to give you a legit product, obviously there is a price range that is in the realm of reasonable reasonableness, but some I've, I've, I've had this conversation with too many people where they say, well, I don't want to pay a dollar a seed from Oregon CBD. I want to get the 20 cent seed you're going to wind up, you're going to be right back at above a dollar having to replace plants and you, you can't skimp yourself on your seed, your genetics with cannabis because of the severity of the compliancy issues. It really is a huge part of your decision process is what genetics you're going to grow. Um, expenses really just come down to labor after that. It's, you can throw as little or as much as you want to at this plant. Um, you really need to know what your end goal is, and that kind of dictates if there will be more expenses or not. Um, I have a question, um, and just a reminder, folks, your last chance to chat in a question if you've got it. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, are you seeing, you, you mentioned something about this, Andrew, when you were talking about get all the highest certifications you can get and that you're you know, USDA organic certified. And I'm just wondering, um, I was hopeful at the beginning of the hemp um, craze that that hemp would be a crop that would be highly certified, organic certified, just given the, the plant itself, which accumulates, you know, whatever kind of pesticides or different things are that are in the soil. And given the end market users, you know, oftentimes being tinctures and, you know, other products that are, um, you know, valuable in the, the kind of the health industry. Is that something that you all are seeing is that, you know, a, a large proportion of hemp crops are um, certified organic? We Definitely seeing that the consumer demand is there and those growers that have chosen to become certified are definitely reaping those benefits by having a, a saleable product. It, it helps you reach a more mature market and audience mm -hmm. having a, a certification that is recognized outside of cannabis. Um, USDA certified organic. We didn't change anything at all with our process when we transferred over, but we did it because we have clients that we work with that are requiring a more traditional agricultural labeling and certification. And that one is just extremely well known. 
Right, right. Yeah, Karen, it just gets you up into that higher level market. You know, I mean, it gets you out of that. There, we've got a lot of that big box store buying that goes on, but this this gets you up a notch. So great. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions, so um, I'm going to thank our three fabulous speakers today. This is the part of the virtual conference that kind of bumps me out because this is the time where there'd be a whole room of people clapping and saying thank you, and our speakers can't even see our participants at the moment, and the only person they can see clapping is me, so I'm going to have to clap really, really <laughs> loud to say thank you so much. That was a fabulous presentation. We appreciate um, your time with us today. And for those of you that participated in the webinar, we appreciated your participation as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Get us out of there. Okay. We have ended.